Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, The Millennial Investor, and in today's video, we are going to go over every stock that I sold in 2020. Now right now, I own 23 companies, and a lot of these, I would say probably at least 15, maybe more of these, I have owned since day one of starting the channel. And I started this way back, if we scroll along this line here, going all the way back to April 3rd of 2020. So April 3rd is when I started this. That is also when I started the YouTube channel for my very first buy. So if you want to see that going back all the way to day one, you can go ahead and follow that. But I'm going to show every single stock that I sold here in 2020. And I'm going to show you buys and sales and information about them. And I'm going to show you my winners as well as my losers. Now I only had two losers, but we had a lot of different winners. When I started off, I had a lot more companies in here than I do currently. But we're going to look at my winners and my losers as well. And all these performance records are not counting dividends reinvested because I know that I'm a dividend investor and every single company that I own, including all these on the list here, are all dividend paying companies. So these are not counting cash flows from the companies. But overall, before we get into that, before I go over all the stocks that I sold in 2020, this is the companies that I currently own in column A right here on the left hand chart. And on these charts on the right, I have my annual dividend income and monthly dividend income tracked on these charts and I update these every single month. Now my portfolio value and monthly YouTube income is also tracked every single month as well in both of these charts in the coming month when I update them next week will be much much higher because we are doing a lot better these are my investing goals for 2021 and my 2021 stock market prediction for the spy and if you look at goal number four is to get 150 people signed up within one finance and i'm so sad that this promotion is almost over because we've been getting people signed up like crazy and not only has it helped benefit the channel but i've helped get it a lot of people started investing that wouldn't have gotten started otherwise so if you want to download this link you can get 30 dollars just for getting signed up and depositing 100 dollars. but all this information Information is down below in the description including lots of other things as well like I said information about mentoring calls you got savings accounts credit card referrals and more importantly my pie if you want to invest in it or see in yourself directly all 23 companies that I own are listed down below but one quick thing I do want to mention is that if you look at my portfolio let's go to the month chart on February 5th my birthday last Friday I broke 10,000 and the crazy thing is is that we are now two weeks into the future almost two weeks into the future as of tomorrow and we are almost at ten and a half thousand already. Half a thousand dollars in two weeks is much better than anything else I could have asked for. And this portfolio, guys, is really starting to take off between the referrals and the amount of growth that the portfolio is experiencing. I'm sure that we're going to have a lot more great winners to sell in 2020. But overall, guys, let's go ahead and get into the first one in my portfolio, which was the biggest winner I had in 2020, and that was Whirlpool, WHR. So let's go ahead and talk about Whirlpool and what they do and why I own them. Now, I will say with all these stocks, I got a little bit trigger happy. When I started in 2020, this was in the beginning of the recession. It, like I said, it was on April 3rd. So when I started buying this company, it should have been around $80 a share. Let's go ahead and go to my activity feed here. And let's go to WHR. And let's go to the first activity that I had from WHR. I first bought this company originally at $81 a share. And today, if we go back to the Whirlpool stock, if we look at WHR, I bought it at 81 and now it's trading at almost 200. And I sold this company for a very high price as well. Like I said, I did start buying it at 81 and then I ended up selling it for $177 a share. And it's trickled up a little bit higher since then, but I did invest that into some better companies. But overall, Whirlpool, it is a great company. It was one that I was extremely bullish on in the 80s, the 90s, and the 100s and even going up to the mid hundreds but once it started eking up towards $200 a share it's still a good company it's not a bad buy per se but there's just better places to put my money right now so Whirlpool is one that I'm definitely still watching oh and by the way I should have mentioned I'm going to go over with all these buys and sells if these are companies that I'm looking at owning in the future or if I'm just done with them if I'm not messing with them anymore and Whirlpool is one that I have on my watch list I'm watching this and if this were to get back to say $150 a share $140 a share I would definitely look at owning this company again but but Whirlpool was one that I had a big gain in, a time-weighted return with no dividends reinvested, which I did receive dividends from all these companies. But just the time-weighted return, I sold this company for over a double up, 104% return. So I'm very happy with that return. And we're going to go ahead and move over to my next one, my second best performer. Let's look at ticker symbol DFS or Discover Financial Services. When I originally started buying this company, it was very, very low. We go back to April 3rd when I first started. Let's see, I would have been buying this company about $28 a share in the 20s and 30s is what I was buying this company at and I continue to increase my position and buy it heavier and heavier and this stock just just took off it, it was insane how quickly this company just took off to the moon and this company is now trading at $90 a share and if we look at it I originally first started buying this company let's go ahead and look at DFS 
when I originally started buying DFS, I started buying it for... I started buying Discover Financial at about $29 a share and I ended up selling it for $76. They don't really have much of a competitive edge that I like, but basically when I saw this and I saw the valuation of $30 a share, I was like, I have to buy this company. Anything I would say today for me to get interested back in buying this company, it would have to be a massive downturn and probably really unrealistic. I would say probably something like under $60 a share or something like that. So Discover Financial is one that I do still have on my watch list, but I probably won't be owning again in 2021 and maybe not ever. Now Qualcomm was another company that I owned and they were a direct competitor to my number one investment. Let's go ahead and look at that real quick. If we go to my number one investment right here, I have 9% of my portfolio targeted towards Broadcom. And what I decided to do, I had a huge gain on Qualcomm. They had those rumors of Apple starting to move away from their products. And I don't really think that's a good thing for the business. And that's even funny. I didn't even notice this till just now. I believe this is actually a lower price than what I sold it at. And Qualcomm, it was already at a very high valuation and the dividend yield was much lower than what I was originally buying this company at. Like I said, if we go to the year chart here and we look at April 3rd, I would have been buying this company at around $65, $70 a share. And since then, it had doubled up in price. Now, I didn't have a doubled up when I sold it. I only sold it for a 63% gain, but that's because I bought it all along the way in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the hundreds. And this company is a very good company. It's one that I'm very bullish on for 5G and the new wave coming out. But overall, it's just not a company that I'm interested in holding at these levels, considering I already have so much in semiconductor chips, specifically focusing on Broadcom. So what I decided to do was sell some of my stake in Qualcomm, put it in Broadcom, and then diversify it between my other investments. And that's why I sold Qualcomm, but I do like the company. It's a great one that I would recommend, but it's just not one I'm interested in owning at these prices. And for me to get interested back into Qualcomm, you would have to see a massive downturn. Not that I would never own it again, but let's just say something like, I don't know, maybe $100 a share is where I'd start getting interested in it again. So not anything that's really realistic there. But Apple is one that I sold also in 2020. And Apple and Microsoft were the two that were heavily debated on my channel and also amongst myself. And if we look at Apple, Apple is a stock that have had a massive run up in 2020 and pretty much just nonstop over the last five years. And I owned Apple at a pretty significant discount and I started buying it in the 60 and $70 a share range. Now since then that stock has about doubled from where I was originally buying it at, not even counting the cash flows from this company as well as raising its dividend from the time that I was holding it. But Apple was a stock that I just saw as it's a great stock to own. I love it, but a lot of these giant tech companies are trading at very high multiples and extremely low yields. And as me for a dividend growth investor, I can see the opportunity for growth as far as the dividend cash flow comes from a company like Apple, but they're just not raising it at the pace that I'd like. Now, I know that share price appreciation will probably be good, but I'd be much more interested in Apple at buying it at $100 a share or less. Hopefully that'll happen. Instead of owning it at $130, $140 a share where there's just not as much value. I'm taking on more risk as a shareholder. But overall, I love Apple. I'll be watching that one for any type of weakness. And hopefully if you could get back over a 1% yield, I would get interested in owning it again. But it's not one I'm interested in owning right now. And that's why I took my nearly 60% gains in Apple. Foot Locker was probably the shortest one that I own in my portfolio. And basically, I just own it for the massive dividend and extremely low valuation. I believe I originally, what was that, April 3rd, I started buying this company under $20 a share. And right now it's trading at 50 plus, not even counting the dividends. They only skipped one dividend payment and they did reduce it to help increase some of the cash flows to help further their business model. But this company trades at a PE ratio that was just ridiculous. I believe when I started buying it, it had a forward PE ratio of something like, like seven or something just crazy like that. And the fact that the company was nowhere near bankruptcy, they had a fortress of a balance sheet, lots of cash, and they returned capital to shareholders. It was one that I owned, and I gotta be honest, I wouldn't have probably sold until we started getting to these 50, 60, 70 dollars a share range. So it was one that I was intending on owning all of 2020, even going into 2021, but they immediately cut that dividend. I believe I only got one dividend payment from Foot Locker. So that's one they ended up selling, and I did sell for almost a 50% gain, 47.82%, and that was one that I will be watching in 2021, but I won't likely be owning anytime soon unless it was just have to be a massive discount, which probably won't happen unless we have another market crash, but that's one I really liked owning, and I do have on my watch list. 
Mid America Apartment Communities was one that I got a little bit enticed by the yield, and I probably won't be owning this one again. And it's basically just a REIT, and it's really simple. They just own apartment complexes all over the country, and they collect rents from their tenants. Now, this company I did start buying. Let's see, let's go back to April 3rd. I started buying it at about $94, $95 a share, and it's currently at $136, so it's done good since then, and it has appreciated in price quite nicely. But I did invest this into some more important companies, some companies that I thought were better, and they did just raise their dividends. So they're not a bad company at all whatsoever, but overall I already invested heavily into REITs and I am so confident in the three that I picked Realty Income, WP Carry, and Store Capital, that I just can't afford to have any more REITs in the portfolio. I already have about, what is that, about 20% of my portfolio just in real estate, so I really don't want to have more than that. So I had to sell out of Mid-America Apartment Communities, but it's one I do have on my watch list, but I probably won't be owning anytime soon. Duke Energy. Now, utilities, this is one where we run into some headwinds because Duke Energy was the same as Dominion Energy, and I'll go ahead and include these two when we get to the next one, but basically... I didn't want to own as many utilities as I had because there were so many opportunities for companies that were much cheaper. Now, there's nothing wrong with owning utilities. I absolutely, I'm, I'm a shareholder of utilities. I'm not against owning them one bit. Now, when I own a utility stock, I know that it's going to trade pretty much flat. Utilities are very boring, very slow, and in a lot of ways, that's what I love as a dividend investor. But the same thing is that they don't have a lot of the upside opportunity and especially the dividend growth that a lot of these other companies have. You can see that going back five years ago, the dividend was 56 cents. And since then, it's only went up to 64. So not a lot of high growth. And I can invest that into companies that have much better dividend growth. And like, for example, I can invest that same amount of money into something like my number one holding, like a Broadcom. If we look at its five-year growth, it's went from 49 cents all the way up to 360. So what is that? That's about a seven times multiple. It's increased seven times its five-year payout. Not to mention the share price has performed much better as well. It's almost now up to five. Good Lord, I didn't even realize that. Look at that. Broadcom is almost $500 a share now. Gosh, I've been buying this company like crazy. Actually, let's go ahead and take a look at that. I know it's not about this video, but yeah. I originally started buying Broadcom at the low 200s, and now it's almost at 500. So massive uproar there. But if we go ahead and look at Duke Energy and Dominion Energy, I pretty much sold them for the same reason. Nothing against them, nothing wrong with them. They do have a pretty good yield, but I sold Duke Energy basically just because there was better places to put my money, and they had already appreciated in price over a rumor of them being bought out, and nothing materially changed with the business and I had a decent little gain of about 10% of the company not counting cash flows but I just decided to go ahead and take my profits and put in companies that were better deserving. Now IBM is kind of like the same story of A&T but IBM basically they're a high yield they're a struggling business and when I started buying these companies in early 2020 when these companies were trading at extremely low yields I was buying this company around $105, $110 a share and look at that it's pretty much traded flat since then so it's a good thing I invested my money into other companies. Actually let's go ahead and take a look at that i'm just curious let's go to ibm because i have no idea because this was months and months and months ago when i sold ibm what did i put that money into because i honestly don't even know let's look here sell on september 17th so i sold ibm on september 17th and let's take off this and let's go to trading and let's scroll back to september 17th here we go okay i sold out of ibm and what i ended up buying was Let's see, I mostly put that money into Johnson & Johnson. So let's look at where Johnson & Johnson has went since September 17th. So if we go to Johnson & Johnson and we look at the year chart, going back to September, let's see, right around here, it was about 150. And since then, it's uptrended about a 10% upwards move to 165, not counting the cash flows, and this company is about to raise that dividend as well. It's one that I'm a lot more confident on and basically just IBM. The management team has not impressed me the way, the same thing as like AT&T, which I'm about to get to in just a second. Now, they are a bit of a turnaround play, and I think they can get back on their feet, but it's just not one that I'm willing to hold out on. And Dominion Energy, pretty much the same as Duke Energy. I like utilities. They're very boring, very easy to own, but they did cut their dividend, and due to that Warren Buffett deal that was made earlier in 2020, this company, honestly, they just got wrecked. They got demolished. And this is the type of thing that I'm talking about. When a company cuts its dividend, you lose the confidence. You lose the trust of the shareholders. And this is the first time I've looked at this company in months. And let's go ahead and look at the price that I sold it at. If we look at Dominion, I sold this company for... Let's see, $75 a share. $75 a share and currently Dominion Energy right now is trading at 73. So not only is this company went nowhere, it's actually a little bit lower than where I sold it months and months ago, which was at this massive drop back in July. So it's been six months since then and the company has went nowhere. 
and the company has not even raised that dividend. They have cut that dividend, and that's why I ended up selling it. And usually this is why dividend cutters are usually under performance as well. The good news is I did get to sell it for a very, very small profit, about a 1% gain plus dividend. So it didn't really hurt me anything, but I'm glad I got out of that one. And I'm still holding Southern Company, the only utility stock that I have left in my portfolio, still being targeted at 5% right here. Now, if we go back, let's go ahead and look at the last two. Let's look at the two losers. I did sell AT&T in 20. 2020. And like I said, AT&T was pretty much the same thing as, say, like an IBM. The management team just sucks. They're horrible. They're the worst. <laughs> okay, there's no other way to put it. And AT&T, it's going to trade flat. They do have an incredibly high yield, and they will raise that dividend probably every single year. But I have to look at a company that I'm positive with. I have to look at a company where I'm psychologically just hooked on the company, where I'm so positive that in a downturn, I'm 100% confident. And I didn't have that with IBM and AT&T. When I own these companies, let's go ahead and look at a company that's struggling right now. Let's go ahead and look at, say, like a Coca-Cola, for example. Coca-Cola has been downtrending for months, and they've really went nowhere over the last couple of years. If you look at the five-year chart, pretty much traded flat in five years. But I'm so confident in Coca-Cola, it could go back down to $40 a share, and I would still be owning this company. It's a wonderful business. It's not one that I'm wanting to sell, and pretty much no share price. Unless the fundamental business of the company just changed completely, I'm not selling Coca-Cola. AT&T, I didn't have that type of convention with AT&T, and I just hated the management team and the decisions they made with HBO Max and their telecommunications business and the massive debt load that they have. While the company does have an impressive amount of free cash flow and dividend payouts, it's just not one that I was interested in owning, and I took a very, very small loss of 1.4%. Now, the good news is I did check. I did receive dividends from this company, and I actually had a very, very small return, so it's not like it even lost me money. I actually made a teeny, tiny, tiny amount of money from this but the good news is i'm out of the company it's went nowhere since and i don't think it'll really be having any type of massive returns anytime soon wells fargo was the only one i really took a significant loss from actually technically if you factor in the dividends it's the only ones that i took a loss from and wells fargo is just one that i'm not interested in owning same thing i got enticed by that massive dividend if we go to its previous payout of 51 cents a share let's go ahead and look at that but at this average price of 25 cents if you take 0.51 multiply that times four they pay $2.04 annually. You divide that by a share price of 25, it would is an 8% dividend yielding stock. And this is why companies like this typically cut their dividend. Now I sold for a much higher price before they cut that dividend luckily, and they cut that dividend, what is that? That's about a 80% downturn? Wow, what a massive dividend cut. And I don't think that Wells Fargo just has the upside potential is where I ended up moving most of my money to the financial sector. I ended up buying JP Morgan stock like crazy. Now go ahead and look at its year chart. Its stock has been uptrending dramatically and still has an impressive yield with no dividend cuts and is already looking to raise that dividend in 2021. I think they're probably going to raise it in the back half of 2021, but this company still produces a lot of free cash flow, billions and billions of dollar net income. They're investing for the future. The management team is significantly better than that of Wells Fargo. And this is the type of company that I could see owning throughout a recession, even if they were to cut their dividend and Wells Fargo is just not that. So I ended up selling Wells Fargo. Like I said, I got enticed by the 8% yield. Like I said, I got a little bit trigger happy, but that's the one I sold. That was the really only loser in 2020. But we had a lot of big gainers, and it's funny to look because usually a lot of people that own stocks in the stock market, they're thinking, oh, I have to own a lot of high growth tech stocks to have these get big returns, right? But if you look at this, a lot of the companies that I own are not tech stocks. Like for example, my top two, Whirlpool, that's a consumer defensive. They make washers and dryers and things like that. And they also make air purifiers, which took off in 2020. Discover Financials. They're just a financials company. They sell credit cards and loans and things like that. Now, these are two tech companies. But once again, my number five, my fifth best performer, Foot Locker selling tennis shoes and apparel. Not a big business there. They have an opportunity, and if you look for these opportunities, when these companies are downtrending, you can sell for massive returns as well. But overall, guys, thank you for watching all the way to the end. Like I said, if you want to subscribe, I invite you to do so if you want to follow on with me, and go ahead and get signed up with this referral link where you can get $30 for signing up. But other than that, guys, that's all I have for you guys today, and I'll catch you guys next time.